I'm not a home run hitter. I don't play conventional sports. Not really good at baseball. But I could hit home runs if you cork the bat and you brought the infield in, you know, 150 <laughs> feet and pitched it right down the center. If you manipulate your environment, you can do things. And it's like a carburetor, you know. Carburetor is a gas oxygen mixture to get the the float to sit right and for the the flow to be perfect. And then you get that perfect idle. Then you're gonna run right. And so you gotta tinker with it until you get that perfect. I love that, man. I love, and of course, I like the car analogy. That's really good. So, well, I guess. I guess what I wanted to pull out of that is for the entrepreneurs that are listening to this, they're looking for these little tidbits, these gold nuggets. Where other people are running from things, run to them. In today's ultra competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to the Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Well, welcome back to the show. I am the real Jason Duncan. Thank you for tuning in again on this podcast, The Root of All Success, where I interview some super successful entrepreneurs on how they got to become so successful. And I have this theory that there are these five keys that every entrepreneur uses to unlock their success. And with their passion, right place, right time, knowing the right people, preparation and plan. And, and every guest on every show, I kind of go through those five things, talk with them about those five things and find out how they became successful so that you can use those same keys because those keys unlock success for everybody. So that's why we do this show. And thank you for being here. If you're listening on a podcast player, Thank you for listening. Please make sure make sure you subscribe and hit the uh, hit the uh, review button and leave us a five star review. And if you don't like what you hear enough to give it five stars, why don't you reach out to me? And let me know what I could do to make it better because we want to deliver great content for you. And if you don't already watch this on YouTube, you definitely want to watch this show on YouTube, especially this episode, because we are recording at a different location today. We're recording at Flight Solutions Hangar at Music City Executive Airport in Gallatin, Tennessee, owned by Kevin McCutcheon, who was a former guest on my show. And we're sitting in one of his hangars here at the airport, and over my shoulder is one of his helicopters and over my guest shoulder, which you'll see in just a moment, is one of his airplanes. And you wanna take a look at this on YouTube. It's very cool, very cool setting here. We normally record these at the Standard Downtown, but today we're recording them at Flight Solutions. So if you are in need of private aviation, whether you wanna buy or sell any aircraft, if you're looking for private charters and you're tired of flying commercial and you wanna get out of that nonsense and you think, hey, my life and business is so important, I cannot deal with the time stress and the rancor that you have to deal with with fly flying uh, on commercial flights, then you need to reach out to Flight Solutions. They're based in Nashville, but have hangars and offices all throughout the country and can get you anywhere you want to go. If you need to buy an airplane, they can find it. If you want to buy a helicopter, they can find it. If you need to finance it, they provide that. And if you need your aircraft maintained, they do a full service maintenance program for all of their owners. So if you're interested in looking up Flight Solutions, you want to talk to them, call them at 615-452-5001. That's 615-452-5001. Or you can send an email directly to them at info at flightsolution.com. That's info at flightsolution.com. And I would appreciate it if you'd say, hey, I heard about you on The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan. So that's where we're filming today. That's where we're recording. Thank you for being here. So um, if you're interested in knowing if you have what it takes to become a successful entrepreneur and you're asking yourself, you know, how do I know if I'm going to succeed? One of the things that I offer is a free success assessment. You can go to therealjasonduncan.com slash success and take a free success assessment at 17 questions that will give you an indication of your probability of success as an entrepreneur. 17 questions, you'll get an immediate email back with a report personalized for you 
on the answers, based on the answers that you gave. And that's completely free, my gift to you. So go to therealjasonduncan.com slash success for that. All right, enough with all the promos. Let's get on with the show. So my guest today, I'm lucky enough to have uh, been introduced to him through another friend of ours, our mutual friend of ours. And uh, come to find out, we're both members at the, the Standard in Nashville, where we normally film uh, these episodes. And come to find out, he lives in kind of the same area that I do, too. So it was all kind of a happy accident that we found each other. But his, uh, he grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and uh, has a very, comes from a long line of entrepreneurs. Both his grandfathers and his step-grandfather all had some sort of businesses on their own, pharmacies or VHS tape businesses and other, other things. They, they, so he understands it kind of in his blood what entrepreneurialism is. And then he grew up, started his own uh, kind of lawn mowing landscaping company as a kid, refed inline hockey, uh, lined baseball fields. He's done, done a little bit of everything, went to DePaul University, was uh, involved in wrestling and boxing and ended up working for the housing authority there. And that kind of took him in a different direction, which we'll talk about today on his entrepreneurial journey. And then he started another company called Channel Partnerships, which is a very interesting Interesting story. He, when we first met, he sat down and told me this, and, and I'm going to ask him to tell more of that story. And then he became a partner in another big company called Rosemar USA, which he's going to tell us a little bit about that manufactures uh, cleaning products. And, and I don't even want to attempt to explain that. He will do a much better job as we get to, there, get to him today. He's married to uh, a lady named Stephanie. They have a beautiful little son named Callum and a huge dog. A Rhodesian Roadback dog, Ridgeback, Rhodesian Ridgeback, like a lion hunter dog. They're like 120 pound dogs, and and a cat, and uh, I think his wife put that in there. <laughs> but I want to welcome to the show a good uh, now a new friend of mine, Eric Albion. Thank you, Eric, for being on the show today, man. Thank you, Jason. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's uh, it's interesting that we live so close to each other. And uh, we're members of the standard of the way we kind of knew each other. And then, hey, you, you live close, and I'm going to be doing the show at the hangar. Why don't you come out and do it out here? So well, thank you for being absolutely here. Absolutely awesome, awesome location, very cool. Uh, not normally sitting in front of private jets. So uh, very, very <laughs> cool. And um, like I said, a pleasure to be here. Well, it's great. I'm glad you're here. And this show, The Root of All Success, is dedicated to kind of the root of success and how you as an entrepreneur started because you've become a pretty successful guy and uh, your, your reputation precedes you. So talk to us about how you got your start in life as an entrepreneur. Sure, sure. So, you know, you kind of touched on jobs at a young age. I think everyone gets into work. You know, we're all part of capitalism here in the U.S. So you get into work because you want to buy something, you, you, you want something. And uh, the things that excited me when I was younger were things that went fast. You know, go-karts, go-peds, mini-bikes. And so uh, there was an opportunity, I was about 10 years old in fourth grade uh, for a paper route. Uh, the kid across the street had it and no longer could do it. It was only about five streets, I mean, maybe at most a couple hundred houses. Um, so not, not a huge, huge thing, but as a 10 year old, you know, making 100, $150 a month, uh, that was a lot of money. And so I was able to save up then and, and buy all my things that went fast. Uh, I lived in, you know, uh, a cookie cutter suburb and you're not supposed to be driving these things on the street. And so the only way that I could get them is if I went out and worked and uh, got the money uh, to start that. And uh, that was kind of my first foray, I would say, into entrepreneurial uh, behavior, you know, looking for ways to, you know, uh, start myself off. And, you know, I, I have a few, you know, kind of a thought process that, everyone is really their own business. And so, you know, to me, that was what started me because this was my first foray into business and um, that's what's kind of led me to here. So 10 years old, take over a paper route, but then you ended up doing uh, some landscaping. I guess sure. a lot, all, all kids mowed grass at some point. So, but you actually started a whole landscaping company. Yeah, so that was, that was later on, that was in college, okay? And so in college, um, you know, I had jobs in call centers, you know, raising money from people that just graduated from a private uh, Catholic school in the city of Chicago, which very expensive tuition. And no one really wanted to call on certain schools the school that no one wanted to talk to was the School of Law because there are people that just graduated with a law degree um, and, you know, they have huge student debt. And, and what I thought was is, okay, well, maybe there's a way to go after the 
the highest fruit because it's going to have, you know, the biggest return. And so what I was able to do is look for people that, you know, graduated a long time ago. So their student debt is pretty far from them. A lot of people that are lawyers, you know, tend to be successful. And so instead of calling and doing what they told me to do, which was follow a script, ask for three amounts of money, and at the end of the conversation, if you didn't get anything, you hung up and you dialed again. Instead, I decided to ask them about their experience at DePaul, tell them, you know, I was thinking about law school, get them excited about what their passion was, get them back to the place that they were. And by the end of the conversation, them telling me their success story, very difficult for them to say no, that they don't have anything after they just told me about everything that they had accomplished uh, to give something to the school. And so that's how I cut my teeth on the phones. And, you know, and, and I would say it was probably my first job where, uh, you know, fear of rejection really came into play. Most people get on a phone, they don't know what to say, you hang up before you even get anything out and, you know, you're behind a phone. So it's easy to do that over and over again. Uh, this was something that kind of taught me to, you know, slow down a little bit, have a conversation and be strategic with, you know, what I was trying to do, not just, you know, immediately come out and say, hey, can you sign me over some money? Um, the landscape company uh, was a little bit different. So in after the call center, um, I needed something that paid a little bit better that wasn't, you know, it was a, a real job, I would say, you know, something that was going to give me 25, 30 hours a week, um, pay down some of my student loans, um, you know, have a job. And, and so through a uh, connection of my mother's, I got a job at DuPage Housing Authority. Uh, at the time, uh, the largest uh, housing project in the city was shutting down Caprini Green. And so they were relocating low-income families to the suburbs. And so these were all Section 8 houses, uh, not the nicest places in town. Um, we did the landscape and, and maintenance, the snow removal landscape. And, you know, as this uh, DuPage Housing Authority was able to grow, so were the labor requirements. They came to me, I was about 19, 20 years old at the time. Hey, Eric, should we, you know, hire on more people or should we contract this out? And, you know, I just being young and, and just asking questions said, well, what if I contracted it to myself? Well, as long as you had a truck and you had equipment and you had your own business, I don't see what the problem would be. And so the next thing I did was get on the phone, start calling, you know, finding about how I could get a loan. No one was going to give me a business loan. I was too young. I had no history. At this time, you could still get a student loan for anything. And so I took out a $35,000 student loan, bought a truck, <laughs> bought all my equipment, contracted it to myself, had the contracts in hand, was able then to go back and pay off you know, all those student loans, um, and had my first business. And it was mainly college and high school kids um, cutting lawns and moving snow, and then uh, putting people, people that didn't want to live in apartments, they were buying foreclosed houses. This is around the housing crash too, so 2018, 2008, I'm sorry. Um, and so the housing market had crashed, and so they were doing these kind of rent-to-own programs. Um, these people didn't make any money, so it was very difficult for them to ever own this property. But we wanted to renovate it and make it look nice, so I'd come in, pull out the bushes, you know, make any changes to make the house as presentable as possible. And that was really where the company started. And what I found in that, and, and you know, and I'll get into kind of the snow removal part because it, it's a hustle, especially in Chicago, you get a lot of snow. Um, and so, you know, what we did is we would find people to come in, do paver stone patios, do, you know, walkways. I wasn't doing this, and this is the same thing you find with general contractors, subcontractors, go find three subcontractors, sub it out, and you take the guy in the middle and you make the difference between the guy in the middle and the, and the highest price. And, you know, and that became my business model. Um, was not the cheapest, was not the best. Uh, there were misplaced funds. Everything in Chicago tends to uh, be corrupt. And so uh, as those funds were misplaced and people got pushed out of jobs, I knew that I wasn't the best. I wasn't the cheapest. My contracts would eventually go up for bid, sold the company, sold the equipment, you know, ended up north on everything. And that was my first foray into business. And the first time I made a deal with myself to say that the next business that I started would be something that I was passionate about and wanted to do and not something that was born just out of opportunity. So you, you were working for the housing authority as one of the, the uh, laborers, right? Yeah, but kind of the supervisor, right? Supervisor. So I was the one, you know, setting the jobs up, making sure that people, you know, cut the lawns, move the snow, 
you know, did any maintenance or upkeep. And then an opportunity presented itself where they needed to get an outside contracting firm. And you're like, hey, I'll do that. So you, right. you volunteered, hey, I'll, I can make this happen. And, and you, I, lo- I, I guess I missed that in the first time you told me the story or I forgot about it, but that is so clever and ingenious to say, you know, I need, I need 30 grand, so to speak, or whatever the number was. I need 30 grand to buy equipment, trucks, and get people going, but no bank will loan me money on a business, but uh, the school loan people will give me <laughs> They, back then, they would give you, you just put your name on a piece of paper and you had a student loan. And obviously, you know, people got themselves in trouble with that. And I paid that back immediately. I know it's not really kosher what I did. I'm not telling people to go and take out loans or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, but being creative. Truth, that, yes, I mean, it correct. illustrates your creativity, which if we look at the five P's of success, plan is the last P that I teach and I talk about with entrepreneurs like you. And, the, and that plan, what I mean is, do you have the strategy to obtain and deploy the resources necessary to achieve your mission well, you know what are you attempting, attempting to do for you you your mission and vision was i want to take these contracts from the housing authority i want to be the guy making this money i need 30 grand how am i going to get it well my plan i'm going to i'm you know, again not necessarily a recommended plan but your plan was creative and said i'm going to go get the money wherever i can get it correct and and you'll see that plan kind of root itself through my other endeavors too raising capital for channel partnerships i mean channel partnerships my first You know, what I would consider real company that I was, you know, passionate about and empowered about um, to raise capital, to to take on the projects that I needed, um, I had to be creative with that, too. Um, Talk about, let's talk about channel partnerships, because I really like that story, because I think it's unique in what you do. So give us, first of all, before you tell how you started it, like, what does it do? What does channel partnerships do? Right, so it's a cost mitigation and vendor procurement company. And so let me back up because it'll make a lot more sense. So after uh, landscaping, after I sold Advanced Landscape, um, I then went on to work for a, uh, a friend's family company. It was a packaging company, about $200 million company. So middle tier company uh, located uh, outside of Chicago, but had in uh, another distribution center in Memphis. And so, you know, there I worked with a couple of people whose kids worked at the company. No one was going to give me accounts. Uh, my friend had come to me and said, hey, you know, I know you would be really good at this because you're always talking me into things I don't want to do. So you'd be a good salesman. <laughs> that just goes back to your phone skills. Right, <laughs> right. And so, um, you know, packaging is interesting because everything comes in some sort of package. So in, in distribution is probably the oldest profession that exists buying or attain, obtaining a mass of things to then distribute, you know, the, the lower allotments of things. And there's money to be made in that. I mean, if you follow distribution paths, and you'll see that kind of pop up in my story here, distribution is really what I do. Um, and so, you know, I worked for this packaging company, um, opened the most accounts, more accounts than all the sales reps, um, you know, combined. And my strategy wasn't going after the big guys, it was going after the smallest customers, people that no one wanted because activity is something. And so what people don't realize in, in sales is sometimes you're not getting the results because the environment is manipulated against you. You know, maybe you're just not in the right environment, but to show that you belong in the right environment, you have to show activity. And so I went out and I opened these. I went and, you know, again, I I make these assumptions in life and I, I attribute this to my success. To me, it's harder to capture a new customer, someone that doesn't know who you are or why they want to do business with you than it is to, you know, go back and get and rekindle something that, you know, at least they already know who you are, a company that already knows, a customer that already knows who you are. And so I asked for all of the accounts that the company had lost in the last five years. And I couldn't get every single one of them, but they would give me the oldest ones first and I'd work on that. And, you know, essentially my sales pitch was, is it wasn't the company, it was just that you weren't working with the right person. I wasn't there to help service your account. And so because of that, it's not that you had a bad relationship with the company, you had a bad relationship with your sales rep, let me fix that. And, you know, uh, that's kind of the assumption that I made is that it would be easier to get this. I opened more accounts. And because of that, they offered me a new territory. They offered me to go to Nashville. Um, We had had a satellite uh, facility there. And um, we had a distribution center in Memphis. And because of that, um, I moved to Nashville, gave me a much better position, gave me more opportunity. This is an expanding market. All right, so for those that are listening to this and watching this, they'll, they'll probably have heard the interruption. We had a jet come by. 
<laughs> and when you, when you film at an airport in a hangar, that is a risk you take. But, but I'm going to go back. So if any of this is a repetitive, uh, listeners will forgive us that this is repetitive. We're going back and asking that question. So Eric, Channel Partnerships is a really interesting company. And so you had the, the landscape company, you sold the company, and then you went to work for some other people. But Channel Partnerships came, like, tell us, just give us 60 seconds or 90 seconds on what it is, and we'll talk about how it got built out. Sure. So Channel Partnerships is a vendor procurement and cost mitigation firm. And so essentially, if you think about a concept of like a headhunter or recruiter, um, you have the employer and the potential employee. The recruiter is placing the potential employee with the employer. And so essentially, that's what Channel Partnerships does. It cuts out. We're qualifying people, knowing their needs, um, in matching them with manufacturers, mainly packaging uh, manufacturers um, that can produce at the level that they procure. And so with all distribution, the main rule is quantity dictates price. So, you know, if you can combine purchasing across and maximize purchasing, you can find savings. Yeah, so channel partnerships, that's what it does. So how did you start that? That's, that's a very unique concept, and how did you start it? Right, so I worked in packaging distribution. A friend uh, of mine's family owned a packaging company. Um, packaging can be anything from corrugated boxes to tape to stretch film, uh, all things that I've sold in the past and, and still have hands in. Um, but essentially, uh, knowing it was a family company, wasn't going to get all the accounts handed to me. Um, you know, some of the other sales reps called it the lucky sperm club as to uh, <laughs> two of the sons of the owners uh, worked for the company and they just happened to get all the big accounts with land on their desk. And so, you know, I knew I wasn't going to get the big fish. Uh, Chicago is if not the most competitive packet mar packaging market, it's number two. Um, so everyone's selling the same thing. Everyone's knocking on doors. Um, so I figured I'd go after, you know, uh, opening the most accounts. And so I opened more accounts than all the other sales reps. Um, that led me to an opportunity in Nashville, uh, probably the best decision I ever made in my life. Um, and so when I came down to Nashville, I landed a big account right away. They brought me down to Martin, Tennessee, and uh, I was handling MTD. They make Toro, Craftsman, Cub Cadet, uh, lawnmowers. And so lots of packaging, a lot of stuff being shipped actually to Germany and was working on some volatile corrosive inhibitors, which uh, essentially are desiccants. They keep rust from, uh, from happening. And so, you know, after I landed this account, Martin is not close to Nashville. We decided that with this account, we could hire new sales reps in Jackson, Tennessee that would manage this and it would be better. I handed this book of business over and they started me in a new you know, uh, progression, uh, still young, 27 at this point, 26. And um, this was for sourcing, uh, global sourcing. And so the idea was is there were emerging packaging markets, China, Turkey, Brazil, Mexico, India, that had products that could compete with US manufacturers or other uh, importers, um, but the cost was lower and they had zero market share. And so what we did is we brought these companies to market in the US, a big one being uh, the Val Group, uh, their flexible film company based out of Italy and Spain, um, who have operations in Brazil. Um, we sold enough stretch film for them to be able to buy Dow Chemicals old facility in Ohio and start manufacturing domestically in the U.S. and bring Val Group to the United States. We did this with tape manufacturers. So essentially what I was doing was working with, you know, emerging markets and, and bringing these markets. In this, what we saw, and, and most of my competitors um, were, were now customers. So as I was a packaging distributor, well, the packaging distributors buy from the manufacturers and essentially in this we were the pseudo manufacturers reps for these brands um, and so with that you know I, I built up a big distributor network of about 200 different packaging companies in the southeast um, eventually the company came back to me and said hey this is great we want to point you in another direction I said I didn't want to go in this direction they said we're not asking we're telling and that's when I knew that my book of business wasn't my book of business it was their book of business that they allowed me to manage and so that's what started to channel partnerships. I constantly found myself asking the question, 
we're only selling this because it makes us a lot of money, right? And the answer was resoundingly yes. So people didn't care what they were selling. They didn't care about solving people's problems as much as they solved about making their nut and selling the thing. So I decided that you know I was gonna start to look for opportunities where how could I solve your, your packaging problems? And sometimes that happens you know, if we're talking about corrugated boxes. Well, corrugated boxes, spend a, manufacturers spend a lot of money in engineers. Those engineers, when you send them a, a problem, they're gonna solve your problem with corrugated. Doesn't mean that corrugated is the answer to the solution. It just means that that's what their designers are paid to do. And so I thought, well, I'll go and I'll find independent design firms. I'll design my own solutions. I know the packaging mediums and the different materials. I'll combine it to have solutions. I brought a great solution. My uncle was in white glove transport. His big account was HP. He was moving cloud-based servers from El Paso to Silicon Valley. And so a cloud-based server could not, not any bigger really than this table, uh, so decent sized footprint, cost anywhere from 200 to 2 million, uh, 200,000 to 2 million dollars. And so the problem was is you could ship it in a truckload, but when you're shipping one, it never showed up the way that it shipped out. And so what they did is they built big wooden containers. I decided that, you know, hey, this is a great project for me to set in on for channel partnerships. So we looked at the wooden container. Wooden container did a really good job at protecting this server. Problem is, is you got a big fixed wooden container. You get it from El Paso or Houston up to Silicon Valley. Then what do you do? You got to ship it back empty? Not efficient. And so a moment, a ha moment came to me when I was in the shower of all places. And I thought, well, what if I could make something, if they can get three turns out of a wooden container, what if I can make something that's not as strong as wood but it's almost as strong as wood, so it's gonna solve the damage issue, but it can collapse, and the return ratio is much higher than just one. And so what we did is we created return boxes, and they were essentially kits that went around the outside packaging of the server, so that way they could ship servers through general freight, save money, save money in repositioning costs, all these found savings to accomplish the same goal, but just no one willing to put the work in to solve the problem. And that's really how Channel Partnership started, was taking all of these pieces, knowing the board, the 30,000 foot overview, and saying, well, this doesn't need to be here, this doesn't need to be here, this doesn't need to be here, why don't you guys do business here? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, So you're the channel that brings the two partners together to hence the name Channel Partnership. Now, I wanna point out something that I think was very interesting in your story is that you said when you were doing phone calling back with, with Ed DuPaul, you know, you were doing fundraising, you were calling on the high fruit. Now, I don't know if people picked up on that, but there's this low fruit mentality. Right. Hey, let's get the low fruit. It's easy to pick. Let's do that. So what you said is that you were calling the high fruit. Right. And, and I think a lot of people, I, I think maybe, maybe people missed that because then, it's, then you said when you started for that, that packaging company, it was you asked for, you told me in your story, you asked for the crap accounts, the ones that had been canceled, the ones that had, yeah, they had lost in the last five years, and that's where, so you have an experience as an entrepreneur, your preparation was that you called on high fruit, high paying, and you also called on the ones nobody wanted. Have you ever, did you ever thought about that you did it on both ends yeah, of the Yeah, well, and so, well, so I have a way of looking at things inversely. And so you're saying the low fruit on the packaging, if you do something wrong, right, if you, if you make a mistake, is it always easy to go to and apologize immediately? The answer is no, it's not. So asking for forgiveness for doing something wrong is difficult. So the assumption is most people don't do that. First thing I said was, I'm so sorry you had a bad experience with us. Let me make this experience right. And so to me, that's not a low fruit, it's actually a high fruit because to recapture something that had bad last, last meeting, bad meeting, oh, okay. and to, to turn it back around. Um, but the other part of what you know, I would say about the calling on the law students, I was manipulating my environment. And so I, I, do the, I did this in another job too. I worked for uh, a moving and storage um, and, and logistics company. And so we'd move furniture, office furniture, we'd move houses. Um, and so when the lead list would come out, you get to pick your own leads. Well, no one was thinking in the way that I was thinking. If people estimated their weight to be the highest, the likelihood is that they have the biggest ones. So I could go and call 20 accounts where other people would call 100, knowing that they have a ton of weight, 
knowing that the job is going to be big. And so all of a sudden I become 30% of the sales because I'm only sh- I, it, I've manipulated the rules to net the results that I want. If I'm going to close on 20% of my calls, I might as well close on 20% of only home runs. Yeah. It's like if you, uh, I'm not a home run hitter. I don't play conventional sports, not really good at baseball. But I could hit home runs if you cork the bat and you brought the infield in, you know, 150 <laughs> feet and pitched it right down the center. If you manipulate your environment, you can do things. And so it's about taking the pieces and, and you know, or I told you I liked engines and things that go. It's like a carburetor. You know, carburetor is a gas oxygen mixture to get the, the float to sit right and for the, the flow to be perfect. And then you get that perfect idle, then you're going to run right. And so you got to tinker with it until you get that perfect. I love that, man. I lo- and of course, I like the car analogy. That's really good. So well, I guess what I wanted to pull out of that is for the entrepreneurs that are listening to this, that are looking for these little tidbits, these gold nuggets. Is that this what is you so, just manipulating so yes. your environment? Manipulating your environment one and the other one that I would say is where other people are running from things run to them there is a problem there that needs a solution and when things are really bad and I'll get to this later with Rosemar uh, the the founder of Rosemar in Mexico and in the 80s um, Umberto Martinez has a saying it's where there's shit there's money yeah and so in the meaning for that is we're in health and hygiene and sanitation where there is literal shit, there is money for us because we clean and disinfect. I, that's so good, man. And, I, I, and I'm glad you told the story because I love that, that, that contrary opinion. And uh, I had another guest on the, on the show recently who talked about how entrepreneurs are unreasonable people. They're not looking for the reasonable way to do things. Or uh, Running towards a problem when everybody else is running from it is an unreasonable thing to do. But as entrepreneurs, that's what we do. So let me go back to channel partners. Channel partner. It's channel Ships. partnerships. So channel partnerships, when you did this, you set this up based on all of the knowledge and the preparation that you'd had in the packaging industry and realized that the two people that needed to talk to each other weren't talking to each other. Right. And that's how you created it. And you created a, re- a really successful company out of that, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And it's not so much that the people that needed to talk to each other weren't talking. It was the people in between that were trying to make money that were keeping them from talking. The solution was never being delivered. The missile never had a missile guidance system. And so instead of getting in the way and, and Channel Partnerships has a, a very good opportunity for entrepreneurs. If you go to a channel partnerships.com. You'll see it. It's called an engagement partner. Uh, I run a lot of BNI groups and uh, I got a lot of business out of BNI because I was different. Everyone else was real estate or finance or securities or whatever, what have you, you know, but no one was packaging. No one was manufacturing, fulfillment, consulting. And so what I found was, is everyone wanted to get in on this. Oh, Eric, I got this great thing for you. You know, just teach me about it. And I was like, no, 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 not teach you. Make the introduction, then we'll go in, we'll bring the right people in, we'll solve the problem. And then you make mailbox money and your true role is to go out and find me more of these and more of them. And that became our sales and marketing strategy. And that's what led me to really have, you know, so I talked about the first you know, project that Channel Partnerships had, the first real success was with the foam fabricating facility um, based here in, well, operations here in Nashville, but had operations in Alabama and Indiana. Um, And I walked in and I had known this company from one of my distributors in the past. And I said, hey, you know, I know what you guys do here. I'd really like an opportunity. Can I do a walkthrough? And they said, we have too many people calling on us about packaging. We're not interested. We don't need anything. And I said, you know, okay, I'm gonna come back. And so persistency is another big thing for me. Went back in and I said, well, listen, do you have a problem that just no one else is willing to solve? And uh, Ace, who actually works for me now, uh, who's the operations manager at the time uh, of this foam fabricating facility said, yeah, you know, I've got this patented box and uh, all the box guys say that for whatever reason, it won't line up. Uh, and what he means by that is you're taking a two dimensional folding carton and you're turning it into three dimension. And when you do that, there's a glue joint normally that holds the box together to, to allow it to, to make a, a three dimensional shape. And so what we found was is that the glue joint was so small and the pieces hanging off were so large that it could never effectively square the box. And so it was a bad design in the initial design. Now he couldn't redesign it because the patents 
were specific to the way the box was. And so I went back to the corrugated engineers that I work with, four or five different firms, and a couple different engineers. Now, I'm not doing everything myself. I'm leveraging infrastructure that already exists. People that know, I just know that there is a problem and I know where to go to get the answer to the problem. And then I take all those solutions and present them to the customer. And so the idea here was is you can't close a box without a glue joint. And I said, you can't close a box without a glue joint. That's not true. You can use this, you can use this. So then I started coming up with ways to do that. So I took something that was a three-dimensional item and I turned it back into a two-dimensional item with a key lock. What people don't know when you're making a box, it's like, uh, like cutting out cookies, right? So uh, you have the liners, the liners make three different pieces, the outside liner, the medium, the fluting in the side, and then the inside liner. Those are your three liners. You run that uh, through a corrugator. That's going to create your sheets. The sheets then go through, um, you know, either an automaton machine, which is your slaughter that's going to turn it into a regular slotted carton, or it's going to turn it into a die cut, like a cookie cut. So what we knew is, is the, the products were going to be, these boxes were going to be stuffed with foam. It's a very manual operation. And so by taking out the glue joint, you take out a process. Every process in this change costs more money. So by eliminating the process, we saved a ton of money. So this box that cost $1.20 that made me about $1,200 a month in profit went from going from $1,200 uh, uh, $1, in profit to $12,000 by just removing the glue joint. And then, the, then went from $12,000 to $24,000 by taking the bottom of the box in and this is a die cut box and the top and running them on the same die so you had an even run rate so all these little efficiencies that you took something that no one want that no one wanted to do you, you took a turd and you polished it into a die and that's what and and that has been one of the keys to your success you've been able to run towards problems other people are running away from that's channel partnership has been able to do that which led you to founding rosemar usa here in the united states so tell tell us a little bit about that Right, so how I got my start, start with uh, Rosemar USA. Um, so, you know, let's go back to the tornado uh, that came through Nashville. Okay, right after the tornado came through, I was out in Lebanon, Tennessee, um, and one of the facilities um, was a facility, and again, nothing is made in one place. That's the thing that you'll learn in packaging. Everything comes from all these different places. Same thing with fulfillment. Well, for Comcast, right? So think about the pandemic with Comcast. Something breaks and your router breaks, your your, um, your TV box breaks. No one can come in your house, so they just send you a new one. Problem is, is this is the beginning of the pandemic. They're saying that COVID-19 lives on all these surfaces, so they need to wipe down all these boxes. The boxes, the routers, the, the extension cords that go in, the plug that goes into the box, they don't come from the same places. They don't come in the same box. They all have to be kitted and then shipped to you. And so I went in there and um, one of the reps said, hey, you know, I sold a truckload of sanitizer here. I made all this money on it. I said, truckload of sanitizer. I was like, oh, I've got an operation in Mexico, a manufacturer that I work with that makes sanitizer. Do you need more? He said, no, I need disinfectant wipes. And so we threw it through our channel. I had someone come to me a couple of years ago and say, why can't Mexico be our China? in terms of manufacturing arm. Why do we send everything to China, all the components to come in for us to do, you know, the last 10% of manufacturing? And, you know, at first I said, well, the infrastructure is not there, the investment, you know, kept going through the reasons why not. And, and eventually said, maybe I need to ask myself why it can't be. And so I started to really mine in Mexico. I manufacture, um, you know, through channel partnerships, I manufacture tape for major brands, um, you know, Johnson & Murphy, Journeys, uh, Gap, Nike, um, you know, a couple other big ones. Um, and what we saw was that they had infrastructure that could support the United States, savings by being closer, cutting down lead times, not the conventional savings of just being lower cost per unit, no trade tariffs, you know, having to order much less, not having to have a, a Chinese bank account uh, without having to prepay, all those things that add into it. And so, you know, as we ran this opportunity through our network in Mexico, 
Um, and this isn't just for Rosemar. I, Channel Partnerships was doing isolation gowns for CVS. I did all the isolation gowns for CVS for their drive-through testing. We reconverted um, a tape manufacturing facility to make a gowns. You know, so we converted things during COVID-19 because the pandemic. Um, and so what that did is it just led me to start onboarding Rosemar. Well, Rosemar is essentially a direct competitor to Ecolab. People look at the products and say, oh, you're a products company. You make disinfectant wipes. In Mexico, that's not our core business. Our core business is based around, you know, going back here into the 80s, uh, food production was trying to enter the United States from Mexico. Didn't meet our sanitary regulations. So there was needed, you know, things were needed to do, to, to be done so that the, the processing facilities um, wouldn't pass along any you know bacteria or anything like that and so they started creating formulas the creation of formulas uh, turned into uh, chemical manufacturing turned into products manufacturing turned into the service of cleaning and disinfection and so this is a 38 year old company that's been doing this a long time however the u.s markets need were directly focused in products so they needed disinfectant wipes we needed sprays aerosols adhesives and what we know about most of the people that are in the specialty chemical uh, industry, it's all been shipped to China. So we secured the supply chain. My background comes from fulfillment, packaging, distribution. We secured the supply chain to then bring a company to market that already had all of the formulas, had everything in its Rolodex, was fully integrated, and was just waiting to do business on the other side. And you start, that's how you started. You partnered with some Rosemar yeah, so ownership my, and opened a open a Correct. Open up Rosemar USA. Essentially what we did. So the problem with Mexico, and this is the issue, this is why one of the reasons Mexico's law doesn't really suit doing business in Mexico, whether you're Mexican or you're, you know, from another country. Um, it's just not very fair. And so if you send money over there and you don't get your product or you're not happy with the product, you got good luck. So what I did is I spent time investing in relationship capital, finding the right manufacturers that had the right footprints, had the right products to offer, and then entering them into the U.S. market. Normally, this takes a long time. With COVID, everything was accelerated. You know, millions of dollars in business turned into over $100 million in business in a very short period of time. And so, you know, what we knew was that Rosemar had reach and had offerings, but had no vehicles. And so initially I had exclusive distribution rights through channel partnerships, channel partnerships, then, um, you know, acquired equity in Rosemar's operations in all of the United States. And what we're doing is we're building mirror images of the entities in Mexico to transfer the company over. And eventually we will be one multinational corporation. Uh, but right now, as we, we are essentially uh, C corporations in the United States with common ownership to the Mexican entities. So I am the founder, one of the founders, one of the four founders of Rosemar USA. Um, I am the CEO and, and you know, uh, director of all operations here in the United States. Um, but I am not just Rosemar. My partners and their family deserve all the credit in the world for uh, building such an awesome company. Um, and having the right solutions. Really, COVID-19 is not a problem that can't be solved with solutions that already exist in Rosemar. Yeah, well, and I think the story of preparation, you know, we talked about plan. We're actually doing your five Ps backwards. <laughs> so we're talking about the plan as a fifth P. We talked about your plan, the resources that you got your student loan. Preparation, everything led you, prepared you for your opportunity at Rosemar, your packaging, your connections, et cetera. So the other three P's I want to talk briefly about is passion, right place, right time, and being knowing the right people. So passion refers to, and again, to the listeners who are just listening to this, not watching it, we're at an airport in a hangar, and we must be here at the busiest time of the day because we've been here all morning recording, no noise, and poor Eric, we get on his show, and it's like there's a jet right out here and another prop plane. So my apologies to the bad sound for those of you listening in your car or out for a walk. But passion is about not just excitement about things like and I but I can I can see it in your eyes like you're excited about stuff. But the things you're excited about are about fixing problems. It's not about hand sanitizers and wipes and corrugated boxes. It's about you love solving problems. Is that am I reading that right? Absolutely. Um, you know, I would say I'm, I'm a very passionate person and really anything that I do. 
um, you know, self-motivator. Uh, I'm at least not in my opinion. I've never been, you know, the one to be overestimated. I'm usually underestimated. And I, I like that. I reside in that. Um, you know, I, I hearken back to wrestling and something that, you know, something that I've, you know, figured out myself, I would say, uh, there are certain positions that you don't want to be in where you're just uncomfortable and, you know, you're really at a, a position of detriment. And, you know, a coach said something to me at one point in time was, you know, if you could just hang through there, it's only going to be a minute and, and you could just be comfortable for that second and regain yourself, then, you know, you can, you can push through and momentum will eventually be back on your side and you can get through it. And, and it was that thought of being comfortable where others are uncomfortable. If you can live in that, if you can, you know, thrive in an area where everyone else says it can't be done, um, that to me is really the motivator. I love when someone tells me, oh no, it just can't be done. Well, that's, I love to debate and argue, <laughs> well, it can absolutely be done. It can be done this way and this way. And so really I would say my passion started there and that propelled me, you know, um, to, to be a state champion in wrestling, um, and, and really kind of set my mentality and my modus operandi for everything else, which is, Hey, listen, you gotta, you gotta get in those areas where everyone else is running from, where everyone else doesn't want to be. And you have to own that. And this is, this is where you're supposed to be the strongest. I'm not even sweating. And so that's where, you know, I would say my passion comes from kind of that, not thinking that it can be done. I like to think of the things that, that can't be done. And that's why I gravitated towards packaging. And, you know, you say my passion's not about packaging. I have a ton of passion about packaging. And the reason for that is because everything comes in a package. There's always a new solution. There's, the problem is never actually fully solved. Everything has a new solution that can come later with more refinement. And it's the same thing with Rosemar. I mean, Rosemar to go back and I mean, although yes, I am a founder and, and a partner in it, but this is someone else's family company that they've started. You know, here's that same thing that I just talked about, the being a champion for this. I liked the fact that I could be a champion of this and with, you know, uh, controlling microorganisms, there is no solution to 100% control and eradication of microorganisms. If that solution existed, we as human beings wouldn't exist. And so it is an unsolvable problem. You can just mitigate the problem. Yeah. You can't eff effectively solve it entirely. And because of that, it'll keep me interested and engaged. And that's what I like. I like the constant problem solving. We started as a product company. We're launching services this year. Um, we have a biotech. We have some very, very cool technology um, and apparatuses to deliver deliver our technology, um, and then I'm creating a uh, proprietary fulfillment uh, apparatus for D2C for big box retailers to be able to compete from a fulfillment and from a uh, logistics perspective against Amazon. Hmm. And, you know, I don't know what you think that that's worth, but the number's in the billions. You yeah. know, what we want to do is here is we want to solve problems and, um, you know, for me, the passion is having a problem to solve. Well, so talk about talk about the right place at the right time and the right people. Those are the last. So, two yeah. Things. So right place at the right time. Um, it's happened to me quite a few times. I'd say, you know, I've been in the wrong place at the wrong time, too, though. You know, I mean, it, it, it is when that opportunity presents itself, taking it. And, you know, I. Um, I, I, I actually attribute most of the things I attribute to to boxing and wrestling and, and things that I've done and that I know. Um, but boxing, I mean, there are times where your mind knows that you're supposed to throw a punch, but yet the punch doesn't happen. When that punch presents itself like, you know, the adage of, oh, you landed a lucky punch. Well, you had to throw it and you had to land it for it to be lucky. It wasn't so lucky. It was taking the opportunity when it presented itself. I wouldn't say it's so much as it's just right place, right time. But when an opportunity presents itself, go for it. Swing for the fences and, you know, you may hit that home run or the grand slam. And so right place, right time, Rosemar is definitely that. Um, you know, the global pandemic is 
been terrible uh, on business, on people, on social interaction, on really everything. And, you know, Rosemar presents uh, a host of products and solutions that solve those problems. Um, when there were no disinfectant wipes, we didn't shut down. We built the largest disinfectant wipe manufacturing facility in Mexico. And so, you know, those things are important to be there at the right place in the right time. Um, but at the same time, it had to be to go and fulfill those orders to say and to put my money where my mouth was because no one else was, you know, sending the account of the, the uh, amount of money that I was to buy product and ship it in and disinfectant wipes to go and to buy raw material at double the market price to, you know, expedite relationships. You can't just start a facility, a manufacturing facility out of nowhere. We had to go in and because we didn't have the time to create the relationship cap we had to pay for it and you know and things have evened themselves out now but it uh, it, it hasn't been without challenge um, right place right time absolutely what about right people who are some people in your life that help you get to success oh man the, the lists are way too long and I don't want to forget anyone uh, my mom has always been a major believer in me my wife who you know quit her job to you know come and work with me and and you know follow me down all the crazy rabbit holes that I like to go down um, my brother for supporting me start he helped me start channel partnerships give me a ten thousand dollar loan I started channel partnerships with ten thousand dollars so if that can't um, you know and and revenues in the millions and so you know if if, if that can inspire you you know ten thousand dollars to start a company and, and ten thousand dollars is not a small amount of money um but trust me it costs a lot more to yeah. start other things well well let me ask you this as we kind of wrap things up in our conversation what do you how do you define success what's your definition of success um, I mean, success to me is, you know, achieving the goals that you set out. And so, you know, uh, um, do I find myself to be successful? Uh, yes, in the goals that I've achieved, but a failure in the ones that I haven't uh, achieved yet. And, you know, uh, success doesn't negate failure. And so I, I continuously fail and I fail probably more than anyone else. And it's just the successes that people talk about. They're not always talking about the failures, but there's a lot of failure and failure is not such a bad thing. It just has a negative connotation. It sucks. It doesn't feel good. You know, you don't want to fail, but you should be taking something out of your failures. Yeah. I have projects that I put my heart and my soul and my passion and I knew they were the, the right solutions and, and they did exactly what, you know, people wanted them to do that still didn't go anywhere. And you could sit there and you could cry and, you know, dig yourself a hole, or you can just put that in your back pocket or your tool belt and know for when that tool is necessary again. If that person had that problem, you can make it a likely assumption that someone else that fits the same, you know, um, profile that they are, the same, you know, uh, makeup, they might most likely have that same problem too. Yeah, well, I think that that's... Uh... I think that you're right there and I think that success in fact is achieving the results that you desire and that failure is a better teacher than success. Absolutely. Like if all you do is win, like the rappers, all I do is win, 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 well then you're pretty dumb because you've never tried anything. <laughs> like what or what have you learned? You're it's not impossible. Learning, you're it's not impossible. learning anything and, from and winning. And success is not just business. You know, I mean, I'm, I cannot even, you know, uh, begin and I like to talk to explain how, you know, um, satisfied that I am with being able to find, you know, my wife and, and raise the family that we have. And, you know, in my extended family, um, you know, family's everything. And foundation is, is truly, to me, the, the you know, and family and, and foundation and friends can be family too. Um, but the foundation that you need for success without that foundation, because, listen, you could build something up one story, you take a fall one story, you're not going to kill yourself, most likely. You get up 30 stories and you fall, you're probably dead. And so, you know, you need that strong base and foundation to be able to build those 30 stories. So if there are people listening to this right now who are brand new entrepreneurs just getting started, want to know, like, what's the advice that people like you sitting in a very successful place in life, what would you tell those new entrepreneurs What's your piece of advice you'd give them to start? What are you waiting for? Start. Don't, don't wait. It's not tomorrow. It's today. Take chances. Life is messy. You know, uh, going back to boxing again, you get your bell rung. You get hit real hard. It doesn't last forever. You got to 
if you got to take a knee and you got to collect yourself, take a knee and collect yourself. Don't be proud and stand on your feet to get knocked out to where you can't get back up. Yeah. And so I would say, um, you know, start immediately. That that's the process. I mean, people put businesses on pedestals and when they really get to it and remove the layers of the onion, they tend to find the same thing, which is it, it takes drive and it takes uh, courage and, and tenacity and persistence. Well, Eric, I really appreciate you being on here, and I appreciate your patience with all the, the jet and airplane noises in the background. We've had to cut a few times, but thank you for being here. The story has been phenomenal, as I knew that it would be. And for everybody listening and watching on YouTube, you know, there it is. I mean, every single time we sit down and talk with a successful entrepreneur, these five things show up in their story. And they might not be apparent immediately. Like, they're not, a, they're not right there at the surface of the story. When you dig in a little bit, they're there. And so you, as an entrepreneur, can also succeed by using the same keys. They unlock success for everybody. The key unlocks the door every single time. Passion. Right place, right time, knowing the right people, being prepared and having the right plan. Those are the things that are gonna get you to success. My mission in life is to help people just like you achieve the results that you want out of life. And I do that through coaching and consulting. I've got an online uh, school, Results University, where I teach entrepreneurs how to start, scale, enjoy, and exit businesses. But one of the things that I do as a part of my mission is I give away one free hour of coaching every single week to some entrepreneur somewhere in the world who has an issue. So it's the real Jason Duncan working with real entrepreneurs on real issues. And if you would like to apply for that free one hour of coaching, then you can go to my website, therealjasonduncan.com slash free coaching. That's therealjasonduncan.com slash free coaching. And just fill out a short form there, first name, last name, email address, and what your issue is. My team takes a look at all the applications every week, and we choose one person that we reach back out to, and you get one hour free with me one-on-one. Now, normally I'm very expensive, but I do this one for free as my way to give back and help entrepreneurs create businesses because I want to see a 1,000 entrepreneurs create a 1,000 businesses every single year. Is that going to be you? Reach out to me and let me know. I'll see you next week on The Root of All Success when I talk with another very successful entrepreneur about his or her journey to success. And as another plane goes by, I'll talk to you next week. And remember, Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success.